and the race for a COVID-19 vaccine is lighting up the tickers of some hot names. One name in particular, CureVac. Shares are absolutely surging this morning. I want to bring in Yahoo Finance medical contributor, Dr. Dr. Dara Cass. Dr. Cass, always good to uh, always good to speak with you. CureVac, um, one of the hottest tickers on our site right now. What do they exactly do? I think their main pitch is something regarding uh, RNA technology. What is that? Yeah, I'm very proud of you, Brian, for incorporating that knowledge of RNA technology. I do what I can. I do what I can. You do, and you're doing a great job. So uh, basically, uh, a lot of these vaccines uh, are approaching the virus from different modalities, and this is one of the mRNA mRNA vaccines. We've actually never seen an mRNA vaccine come to market, but it is a technology that seems to work well with this coronavirus. The Moderna vaccine is also an mRNA vaccine, and so we're working on multiple mRNA vaccines. This press release was really more like an exciter, excited utterance about the idea that they're hoping for accelerated approval when their phase one clinical data comes out later in the fall, and they're planning on going from phase one to phase two. Not really any new information that came out, but still, I guess, exciting that another vaccine seems to be moving forward. What is their RNA technology, Dr. Cass? Can you explain that to us in layman terms? I actually think that it's a it's a bit of a distraction to actually explain it in layman's terms because we are all trying to be understanding the nuances of the market and or the nuances of vaccine development. Just realize that it uses the genetic code of the virus and actually attacks it from a different modality than the outside of the virus and really uses as an opportunity to integrate into the virus and uh, invade it from a different way and then uh, duplicated and replicated in a new way. It's a new pathway to a uh, vaccine and immunity, but and we've never actually had a vaccine work this way before, but it is very promising for viruses like this coronavirus. Dr. Kess, is there one company that you're watching that is starting to pull ahead in the COVID-19 vaccine race? I think you hit mute. Uh, Dr. Kess, I think you hit mute. Technology. I got it. Technology. Yeah, right. Exactly. So basically, I think that there's a, I would say two or three vaccines are moving forward quickly. And we were very excited when we saw the vaccines that instilled both uh, T cell immunity and humoral immunity, uh, knowing that we saw the antibody develop, the antibody development and the T cells. I would say that Moderna vaccine, the Oxford vaccine have both been very exciting, um, but we're really seeing a bunch of candidates do very, very well. Uh, so we're excited that we're going to have a vaccine in the next probably year, year and a half. Dr. Cass, there's a report out um, saying that that families, uh, wealthier families, are actually opting to send their children to school for some in-person classes versus lower income families who are going all remote. Can you explain why you think we're seeing that trend? So I think that a lot of it is the the delayed effects of what happened in the first wave of the virus, where families that had an undue exposure or multiple exposures really were hit very hard from this virus and had a different lived experience in lower income families uh, than, than the higher income families that could remove themselves from the virus. So I think it's probably a first person narrative issue. I also think that uh, a lot of higher income families feel like they can try it and if it fails, they can back off. And they're really not incorporating that cost of having the virus in your family, not being able to contain it, not being able to undo the steps forward. So I think that it's going to be a multi, it's a multifaceted decision about what you have to do as far as your essential health care, if you're an essential worker or if you have child care. Um, so it's complicated. And I think a lot of families are struggling with that choice right now. Doctor, we're supposed to get uh, guidelines today from the governor on reopening gyms in New York. Uh, give it to me straight. Is it safe for me to go back to an indoor gym, even if they limit capacity to, let's say, 50 percent uh, of their potential? So I'm looking forward to the governor's guidelines for exactly that reason. There should be ways to start using indoor gyms at a city that has a viral level of New York City uh, with decreased density, increased ventilation, planning, like we talked about, scheduling yourself at your gym workout, even if it's not just a class. I myself have embarked in a outdoor cycling class. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. And I think that it's really, um, it's a move in the right direction, watching these businesses innovate their business model and make sure that they follow public health guidelines while moving moving forward is actually really exciting for a city like New York that got hit so hard when the pandemic was hard in March and April. You know, there's that, and I know that the gym owners are actually suing the governor now, is suing New York State, because they're saying we, we need to be able to open. With infection rates this low, we should be able to open. But there's that little part of me, and I'm not a scientist, who thinks 
it's probably we're, we're low. We've got these low rates because we're not doing things like opening up our gyms and we're not having uh, in dining at, at our restaurants. And shouldn't we be doing that a little longer to make sure we've really got this thing under control? We should. And I think that one of the things that is important to remember is that these business owners are hurting and a lot of their litigation and their frustration is in the idea that they were not bailed out by the federal government the same way, uh, certainly not to the degree they needed for the businesses staying closed. That's true for restaurants and for gyms, especially. But I think that we're seeing as long as we follow the science, we should should be able to continue to move forward. So suing the governor does not seem very useful to me. Getting the virus under control and moving forward deliberately, proving that we can have gyms at capacity of 25, 30%, then going to 50% and maybe even higher, while still encouraging mask wearing, mandating mask wearing, making sure you don't overstep is probably the best way to keep those businesses afloat long-term. Where is my biggest risk? Let's say I do go back to the gym in a week or two. I'm not there yet mentally, but let's say I do. Where's the biggest risk to me? Is it that air ventilation system? Is it touching the, a machine that wasn't cleaned? Where, what should I watch out for? So honestly, the most important thing always will be proximity to other people, right? The ventilation systems and the surfaces are small risks, but the highest risk is going to be, are you working out in proximity to somebody else and neither of you wearing a mask? I would say that the interesting part about fixed cycling or other events that don't move in, a, in an aerobic exercise is that you know that everyone's staying at least where they're, they're supposed to be. If you put bikes six feet apart, people stay six feet apart. But if you're allowing them to go into a gym and use machines and they get too close and they're not wearing a mask, that would be my, my, the biggest risk and the thing that I would avoid the most. And I think that's a lot of individual responsibility when and if we do open gyms in New York. Dr. Cass, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about what wearing a mask while doing exercise does to the person wearing the mask. I mean, you know, there was talk about, oh, there's too much CO2 now going into my system because I'm breathing heavily into this mask. Is there a danger to us to be exercising while wearing a mask? So there's no data to prove to say anything that it's dangerous or even remotely contributes to people passing out, retaining CO2. I can go into the technology of both vaccines and carbon dioxide retention, but it's probably too complicated for this segment. Just realize that there are people that have run a marathon in a mask. My husband, if he's in New York City, runs a mask or outside, you know, in Long Island, he doesn't. I think that it's really okay if you're going to exercise to do it in a mask, but make sure that you're comfortable. Being uncomfortable a lot of times is what gets people anxious and that anxiety can overwhelm them. So it's not really as much a physiology issue as it is a mind over matter issue. If you're not comfortable exercising outside in a mask, then you probably shouldn't do it. All right, let's leave it there. Yahoo Finance medical contributor, Dr. Dara Cass. I mean, Quan, you thought I didn't know about RNA technology? Surprised you, I bet, right? I'm impressed. All right, Dr. Cass, we'll talk to you soon. Hey, investors, Zach Guzman here. Are you interested in learning more about the markets and getting the latest financial news? Well, then click right here to subscribe to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Get the latest up-to-the-minute market analysis, big interviews in the world of finance, and information on how to manage your money every day, wherever you are.